Welcome, dear viewers, once again to Storytime with Sethorvan. Once upon a time, Sethorvan did not have Thalassophobia. And then Subnautica came along and was all like, Are you sure about that? Let me tell you all a little story. One day, I was sitting at my computer when I happened to get a notification from the Epic Games Store that this little game known as Subnautica was being offered for free for a limited time. At the time, I thought, oh, I remember that one. That's that underwater game that was in development for a few years, and the one that the funny internet screamy man played. And hey, it was free, so I figured, eh, why the heck not? So I downloaded it, installed it, and then didn't touch it for several months. Then, one fateful night before one of my streams, I was unsure of what game to play when I happened to remember, all right, I had that Subnautica game, I should play that. I'm sure this'll be a fun little adventure for a stream or two. Oh, how little I knew. Subnautica would go on to not only become one of my favorite games of all time, but also be one of the most successful series of videos I've ever published to this channel. That's why it's taken me more than a year to finally talk about it. <laughs> In all seriousness, I had planned to do a video like this a while ago, but with Subnautica Below Zero having finally come out of early access, my plans were delayed a bit as I started umming and erring over whether or not I should. And since I'm here now, I think it should be obvious which choice I ended up making. At the time of recording, I'm still playing through Below Zero, and I'm still publishing that playthrough on this channel. And once that's all done and wrapped up, I plan to do a full comparison video between the two games, as I already have quite a bit to say about them. Subnautica was not only a great game, it was one that left a lasting impact on me ever since fully completing it. And by that I mean I'm fairly certain it traumatized me, but we'll get into that. It's no secret that this game has earned a reputation for being a horror game wearing a crafting game skin, but that's not even close to the full story. The entire Subnautica experience is hard for me to put into words, but I'm still gonna do my damnedest. And while it should be obvious, I'll say it now anyway, major spoilers for this game are ahead. So if you have yet to play it and had plans to this weekend or something, I'd recommend doing that first, as this is the kind of game that only gets better the less about it you know going in. There's a lot to talk about here, and I've got plenty of enthusiasm to channel into shameless nerding out, but we gotta start somewhere. So grab your purified water rations, your salted peepers, and your spare batteries, and get ready for a long journey back into the dark, murky depths of this brilliant little game. Subnautica sets you up with a pretty typical survival scenario. The main character gets caught in a catastrophic accident that leaves them stranded, alone, and lost in completely uncharted territory with no clear way back home. It's a tale as old as time. But what's that saying again? It's not the idea, it's the execution. What Subnautica does so brilliantly with this idea is that just about everything in it is made to make you feel like you're alone. Not just alone, but lost and completely out of your element. To put it simply, this game has some of the best atmosphere I've ever experienced in a visual medium, let alone just in gaming. You start off in the brightly lit safe shallows, where everything is vibrant and peaceful, allowing you to figuratively and literally get your feet wet in a calm, welcoming environment. You may get the odd stalker attack every so often, but they can be easily dissuaded if you fight back, even befriended with the offering of a peeper or two. There you go, buddy. Enjoy. Ow! All right, fine. Message received. This'll likely be where you set up your first base, as all the basic crafting materials are easily within reach, and you have an abundance of small fish roaming around for easy food and water. Eventually, you start getting distress signals from other nearby escape pods, prompting you to gather supplies and head out for expeditions in search of survivors. You, of course, don't find any, and we knew we wouldn't, but the biomes surrounding these pods contain pieces of vehicles and tools that can be recreated. You start to take more risks, venturing out further and further each time, following those distress signals that now carry the promise of gear and supplies, but as you do, the feel of the game gradually changes. You'll start finding creatures that are infected with some strange glowing pustules and eventually get warnings of an unknown bacteria infecting you as well. Each pod you come across is empty, damaged, forcefully torn open, and most of the time all that can be found inside is a data pad containing the last recorded thoughts of its previous inhabitants. Ozzy's log. It's the day of the crash. I 
I don't know what the heck is happening. I'm scared and I'm not going outside. You find more technology fragments, but they begin to require more unique materials, pushing you to explore further. And you just keep going deeper and deeper. The world grows darker as little light reaches you. The once clustered environment of life and vibrance melts into one of darkness and murky uncertainty. You hear strange noises. The creatures you see become more unsettling and alien, some more hostile than others. The bright and beautiful surface that you once swam through is nothing but a thin veneer over what lies beneath. I may have gone the wrong way, but it's fine. I'm sure I'll find my way eventually. The alien bacteria infecting you progresses. You start to find alien structures, monuments, and facilities made by those who were here long, long before you were. You uncover the identity of this strange bacteria, Kara, and how it left most of this planet, and countless others, completely lifeless. More and more story is uncovered with each datapad and monument you find. Mysteries continue to build as some questions are answered, but the breadcrumb trail keeps going. And it keeps going. And it keeps going. Before long, you're so deep you feel like you're in another world entirely, and you find yourself in a much bigger story than you thought at first. It's no longer just a simple survival scenario. The story has now become piecing together the history of this broken world, finding a cure for Kara, and of course, getting home. The progression of Subnautica's world and its narrative is handled so well, it almost feels like an accident. But even if it was, that wouldn't make it any less enthralling to me. The environment and sound design create one of the most immersive worlds I've ever experienced in gaming. You may have one that tops this, but for me, nothing comes close. Even after becoming familiar with the world's layout and everything in it, I still get nervous when venturing out into the deeper portions of it. Piloting the giant Cyclops submarine into the Brine River or the Blood Kelp Forest still puts a tingle down my spine. I'll sit completely still, staring out into the world as it keeps growing darker, getting so tense that I jump when I bump into something, or when that something bumps into me. This is what Subnautica does so well that so many traditional horror games don't these days. Create an environment that instills terror. Now, terror and horror are very different things. Horror is the reaction from seeing or experiencing something immediately frightening or threatening. It's the panic from having Freddy Fazbear pop up and scream in your face, or from Slenderman appearing beside you and hitting you in the face with a piano. But terror is something else entirely. Terror is that feeling of fear and apprehension from thinking or anticipating that something frightening is about to happen. It's that shivering sensation you get when you swore you heard something or saw something dart just out of your peripheral vision. The lingering unease in the back of your head when you stare out into a deep, dark abyss, wondering if something is staring back at you, and fearing if that something will want to come say hello. Even if Subnautica from a strictly graphical fidelity standpoint may not be exactly top of the line or bleeding edge, it doesn't need to be. You don't need the most cutting edge of tech to make a great world. Good art design, lighting, or lack thereof in several cases, that's all far more important than just the amount of polygons or high-res textures on screen at once in my opinion. Ow! Just look at Minecraft with any shader mod installed and you'll see what I mean. The feel of the game changes completely when you go from day to night, and I'd often try to time my expeditions in the day as much as possible because going out into the deeper areas at night, even on subsequent playthroughs, still had me feeling anxious. There's an indescribable feeling I get when I pilot my submarine out into open ocean, unable to see the floor or any landmarks, having to just trust my gut instincts. I'd call it similar to Vertigo, but I'm not really sure if that's accurate. It's not a good feeling either way, I'll tell you that. Sonar upgrades for the Seamoth and the Cyclops exist, and they certainly help with navigation, but what I love is that they only go out one wave at a time with each press of the button, highlighting the terrain and everything that moves as it goes. It gives it this sense of dramatic weight as you stare, watching for whatever it hits. And I can't be the only one who thinks that the sound it makes helps with that. Now, I mentioned that the game makes you feel not only out of your element, but also entirely alone. Every pod you come across is empty, and every trail towards survivors you think you find leads to a dead end. However, you do get a brief moment of hope as you're contacted by a rescue ship fairly early in your playthrough, and you even get a timer for when they'll touch down on a nearby island. But really... You 
You didn't think it would be that easy, did you? As an aside, I heard that in earlier versions of the game, the alien gun platform here actually looked like a giant gun. And I have to say, I approve of the new design much more. It just looks like some strangely designed alien structure with no clear purpose until it starts moving and by the time you realize what it is, it's too late. You're alone. No one's coming to save you. There is no other survivor here except for you. Now, all this atmosphere, brilliant as it is, can only really do so much before the player starts getting braver and becoming more familiar with it. Familiarity brings comfort, and even the most horrifying of locales can become business as usual to someone who's been there long enough. So what better to discourage that familiarity and keep the player afraid than a clear and constant threat? So how do you keep a player from exploring the darkness and becoming familiar with it? By hiding giant monsters in it that want to eat them, of course. The Leviathans are the game's answer to your brain constantly asking, is something out there? Yes, yes there is. It's angry, hungry, and much bigger than you. Every Subnautica player will encounter a Leviathan at some point, and after you do, the feeling never goes away. And it hits particularly hard because the first Leviathan you'll probably see is the Reefback, these gentle giants that barely even register your existence. But the first time you run into a hostile Leviathan, well, to say it's a wake-up call is putting it lightly. Now you know they exist, and your brain won't let you forget it. The knowledge that these huge, hostile creatures could be out there is always in the back of your mind putting you on edge. And this keeps most players afraid of venturing out too far, for fear of finding out what else is waiting for them. Now, it's true that there is only a few hostile leviathans throughout the whole game, but in my case, that feeling of unease and tension has stuck with me even when I know where most of them are. And in my first playthrough, I was constantly afraid of going out into the deep waters and suddenly seeing a giant, roaring face charging at me from the darkness. Remember how I said that I'm pretty sure the game traumatized me? Well, it was right about the point I first became aware of the Reaper Leviathans. Amazing as it sounds, I actually did not know these things existed in my first playthrough. I barely knew anything about the game at the time. So when I heard these odd noises off in the distance as I was roaming around the Aurora, I didn't know what to make of them, until I happened to turn around at the right moment and caught a glimpse. It was brief, but it was enough. What the fuck? What the fuck? What the fuck? What the fuck? I saw that! I saw that! That was a tail! That was a huge fucking tail! What the fuck? From that point forward, I was petrified. I was afraid to even leave the small sand mounds around the ship. Of course, I did eventually press on, but as I got closer to the front of the ship, the screen began to shake as the Aurora's weight shifted, causing noises and rumbles that, combined with the fear and anxiety I was now feeling, was giving me a severe case of sensory overload. Then once again, I heard those strange noises and turned around to catch another sighting of a Reaper stalking me. Oh my god! Oh god! I don't blame people if they thought I was playing this reaction up, as is the expected norm for YouTubers, but I promise you, everything in that moment was 100% genuine. After that, I was on high alert every time I went out into the open oceans, and I never, I repeat, never went out at night if I could help it. Even to this day, hearing the distant sounds the Reaper makes still makes me tense up, and it's only the Reaper. The distant noises of the sea dragon and the ghost leviathan- Does the ghost leviathan even make distant noises? I don't think they do. But either way, those two don't hit me nearly as hard as the reaper does. Every time. I say this game gave me thalassophobia, maybe I already had it and I just didn't know it. 
Now, giant screaming nightmare creatures that want to eat you is certainly a great way to make the player utterly brick themselves in the moment, but Subnautica doesn't just throw them at you without a care. It makes the effort to keep that fear fresh for as long as possible by making your interactions with them rare. The fact that there are so few of them in the first place is deliberate for this reason. And even when you do get attacked by them, they'll only follow you for a few seconds before breaking away, giving you a chance to escape. But most importantly, they warn you of their presence beforehand. Again, with the exception of the Ghost Leviathan, I think, the Sea Dragon and Reaper Leviathans will make constant noises as you close in on them, getting louder and clearer the closer they are to you. When you hear them, they act as a deterrent since now you know these noises are a threat. This thing should be fine to leave here. Again, familiarity brings comfort, and the game does these few things specifically to keep you from achieving that familiarity for as long as possible. What I love, though, is that it doesn't do this through some artificial scarcity like scripted appearances that only last for a few minutes and then they vanish. These giant monsters are always there for you to approach, but it's your own fear and hesitance holding you back from interacting with them. I guess, in a way, the biggest obstacle that a Subnautica player has to overcome is themselves. Yeah, okay, I guess that is kind of pretentious. Now, imagine if the game didn't have the Leviathans be so rare, or were programmed to relentlessly attack you without letting up. Sure, they'd be more immediately intimidating in the first few moments as they just don't stop coming, but after dying to them several times, you'd become more annoyed by them than afraid of them. Being forced into interacting with the Leviathans more would ruin their entire point. They're threats, yes, but they're threats that are meant to deter you, not kill you. At least most of the time. This moment came at a much later point in my second playthrough, but when I made my way down to the lava area, the Sea Dragon Leviathan within was a lot more aggressive this time around. It would zero in on me even when I was a good distance away, and even try to attack me when I was in the goddamn mountain. I was having to go through this part, periodically hearing this giant thing screaming in my ear and blasting the wall of rocks between me and it with fireballs. Jesus Christ. And yeah, that was scary. Having to timidly peek my head out each time I left the mountain to scan above and around me before scrambling back to my cyclops in a panic made me realize just how terrifying these things are, especially since in my first playthrough, I barely interacted with them at all. Watching this face snap in my direction as this giant body swims toward me is a feeling I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. On top of all that, this particular sea dragon seemed to have inherited the power of Noclip as it phased through solid matter. Repeatedly, I might add. Okay, no, no thank you. No thank you. No thank you. Yep, yep, yep. Hi, how you doing there? How you doing? Okay, listen, I need you to leave me alone, please. Okay, what in the fuck is this? Is this thing even real? And the damn thing chased me all over the caves. I was safe when I was in my Cyclops on silent running, but it sure didn't feel like I was. Having something that big, that angry, and that persistent as a constant threat was horrid, and that is a good thing. However, this can also be a double-edged sword, and this is a good example of what I mean when I say more regular interactions with Leviathans makes them less scary. After finding what I needed and sneaking my way down to the lower level, I continued on to the primary containment facility, the last area of the game. In front of this facility, there's another Sea Dragon Leviathan on a constant roaming path that is always there, and after my harrowing experience with the last one, I wasn't exactly in a hurry to introduce myself to it. It even took a bite out of my Cyclops as I passed. Okay, you're getting a little low there. I need you to. <laughs> I only got so much. Uh, only got so much real estate here, you know. <laughs> uh, good, good talk. 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 However, each time I had to leave the primary containment facility to get something out of the Cyclops, which was on more than one occasion, it was no less aggressive than the one above it, and I would almost always have some kind of altercation with it. I quickly figured out the best way to avoid it, and of course, one blast with the stasis rifle was always enough to stop it. 
It also didn't help that it seemed to have a hard cutoff point to its aggro range that I happened to park my Cyclops past. This happened enough that it became more of an inconvenience to be circumvented rather than a great big threat to be avoided, like a toll booth or an angry roommate. And now, we present... Seth arguing with a giant fish. Hey again, how you doing, buddy? Whoa, hey, you're getting a little close there, friend. Yeah, 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 look. I get it, alright? I get it, you really don't like me. But look, I gotta do some shit, okay? So just sit tight right there, please. You're just gonna sit there in the corner and sulk now? Really, man? Come on. Yeah, I know, I know, I know you're angry, but get the hell over it. You just eat your jelly rays and, uh, and, uh, yeah, bye. <laughs> See ya. Can't even leave without you giving me shit, huh? Or did you just want the satisfaction of making it look like you ran me out? Is that it? God, you're a fucking child. I'm gonna chalk most of this up to a bug though, cause I do not remember the sea dragons being nearly that aggressive in my first playthrough. The no clipping part is consistent though. Whoa. What the fuck? What the fuck? Whoa, hi there big guy. Hi. Uh, who, what? The leviathans are rare, but constant threats that do what they're meant to make you afraid to go out into unknown territory. However, after a while, most Subnautica players will become familiar with their locations and find ways to deal with them handily and therefore make them less scary overall, but this is, in fact, a good thing. Even I went from being absolutely terrified of the Reapers to... Whee! <laughs> Are we still hooked? We're still hooked. Here we go! <laughs> Whee! <laughs> this is all part of the progression of Subnautica, going from being lost and afraid to experienced and knowledgeable over the course of the entire game. Familiarity brings comfort, and it doesn't stop you from achieving that kind of familiarity, but in a way, it makes you work for it. Am I reading too far into this? Eh, maybe, but that's the impression that I was left with. Oh, yeah, I should probably mention the void, the outer edges of the map, where everything goes completely dark, and after a while, this happens. That's a huge bitch! By the way, when I was making my original series, I was told over and over again, go to the void, and in some cases, flat out spoiled on what was out there. So I didn't go there, partly out of spite, admittedly. Also, as a fun little extra, when I was gathering footage of the different leviathans for this video, me and this reaper here kept running into each other and eventually got into a bit of a one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, you're not the only one with sonar, huh? Sucks, doesn't it? You might know everything I'm going to do, but that's not going to help you since I know everything you're going to do! Strange, isn't it? On. Gotcha! Hold still, please. Uh, that's mine. Don't do that. Don't do that. Wait, no, I didn't mean to... Uh-oh, that's not good. Oh! Well then. Wait, what? Am I alive? Okay. Subnautica's world and its many threats are huge reasons why the game is so memorable, but the story is what ties the entire experience together, and it's a good one. The history of the precursors and their goals, the alien bacteria known as Kara that's infecting the planet and slowly killing it, the fate of the last crew that came to this world before you, the audio logs of all the previous survivors of the Aurora crash, it all creates a solid narrative, helped a lot by its presentation. The voice acting in this game is all around stellar. Everyone gave a good performance, and despite the fact that you never see another human in the entire world, the audio logs and even the writings you find give each character more personality than I've seen in a lot of main casts in other games in general. I'm uh, not really a doctor. I know that's what my ID says, but I never have been. Cheated the medical exams. We have to board the Aurora, repair the long-range comms, make contact with the other survivors, 
We can't be the only two that made it. Those are not the orders the captain gave me, and they are not the orders I'm giving you. This isn't chain of command, it's survival. My obligations as acting commander don't turn on their convenience. Get out of the water. They also help detail the kind of setting you're in and give you brief glimpses into the culture of the Megacorp Altera. When was the last time a top surgeon actually cut someone open? That's what the robots are for. In the case of the Degasi crew, the ship that crashed here before you did, you'll likely end up finding a lot of their audio logs out of order, but each one doesn't feel like filler. Each log gives a glimpse into the increasing divide between the surviving crew, how Paul Torgel keeps trying to take control of the situation but is so woefully inexperienced in survival situations, the mercenary Marguerite Maida constantly butting heads with him, and Paul's son Bart growing increasingly frustrated with the both of them as he tries to learn more about the world they're in. Again, I have to give full credit to the voice acting here. You see, Chief, you brought us to this sodden planet. Told us we'd see a lush payday. Now what do we got some six weeks later? A dead crew, a habitat that's half buried, food washed away. I suppose the executive decisions would be better left to someone with your extensive experience of hitting people in the face. I know enough not to take unscheduled detours to uncharted planets. That's something you don't want to learn the hard way. Please, stop fighting and listen. We're sick. What? How? You've been coughing, right? Feeling itchy? Blisters? Yeah. The biometrics would have warned us if we were sick. It's something new. It's not in the database. I have had it with you, risking our lives. Oh, stow it, Chief. The kid can't kill this disease without fish to study. I'm just bringing him home. What? Tell her. Tell her I'm right. You're both wrong. The choice to have a silent protagonist also gave the story much more opportunity to instead focus elsewhere. This is something that I think a lot of people underestimate about silent protagonists in general. Having the main character not speak a word isn't done out of laziness, it's a narrative choice. Heck, Half-Life did this. It was one of the first games to incorporate the idea of a faceless mute being led along by the nose without choice into its overall theme and narrative, and of course poke fun at it in the sequel. Man, a few words, aren't you? But unlike Gordon Freeman, Subnautica's main character, Riley Robinson, is the kind of silent protagonist I personally prefer where they don't speak, but periodically have moments of showing personality through their actions. It ain't much, but moments like this add just a bit more color to the beige that most silent protagonists end up being. But even if Riley was just Gordon Freeman but underwater, I'd still prefer it because the world is the star of the show. The atmosphere, the alien life forms, the story of the precursors and the other survivors, and even the hints at the state of humanity outside of 4546B are where all the effort went, and it shows. But it would be remiss of me to leave out one important aspect of our main character, their PDA's AI companion. Its voice, quips, and occasional unintentional sarcasm have become iconic, and are an example of the game's taste and humor. It's dry, but done well, and only often enough to give you a brief snicker or chuckle, a small break from the crushing loneliness. Copper is an essential component of all powered equipment. Your probability of survival has just increased to unlikely, but plausible. In fact, the new PDA voice in Below Zero is the hardest thing for me to get used to because I like the old ones so much, but we'll get into that in a different video. Going back to the story, Subnautica has multiple narratives that you learn about and experience all at once. The first being Riley, Altera, and the survivors of the Aurora, the second being the fate of the Degasi crew, the third being the Kara bacterium and the precursors who were trying to cure it, and the fourth being the story of 4546B itself. But who is that told through, you may ask? Well... What the fuck? Oh, what the fuck? Uh... What are you? I could ask the same thing of you. You know how I said you were alone? That's not entirely true. Throughout your journey, as you go deeper into the world, you'll periodically get these weird visions of this thing that's talking to you, telling you to come to it, that it wants to help you. But what is it? Well, when the Precursors came to this world in search of a cure, they found one. Or at least, the potential for one. In the form of Enzyme 42, produced by only one specific species of Leviathan, native to 4546B, the Sea Emperor. Are you here to play? 
I love the Sea Emperor. They're this massive, imposing, powerful looking creature that's entirely docile. They're sentient, highly intelligent, telepathic on top of that. But they have this almost innocent simplicity to the way they talk, yet clearly are capable of contemplating ideas and concepts far beyond the average sea monster. We are curious whether you swim with the current or fight against it as they did. When the Precursors first learned about Enzyme 42, this was the Sea Emperor they captured to try and find ways to produce it for themselves. But this one couldn't produce enough, likely due to old age, and in captivity, their eggs wouldn't hatch. The Precursors grew so desperate to cure Kara that they resorted to forcefully removing the egg's fetuses, but this, of course, was all in vain. The Emperor tried to contact them, but apparently couldn't be heard, likely because the Precursors were more cybernetic than biological. So when Kara was accidentally released into the world, killing off almost all life on it, including the microorganisms that the other Emperors fed off of, there was no way to stop it. And so the Precursors quarantined the entire planet. The Emperor only managed to keep itself and this small patch of life left alive by telepathically attracting peepers down into the filter vents that connected to its aquarium, and taught them to bring what little of Enzyme 42 it could produce to the surface. Yes, this singular, massive creature that has possibly lived thousands of years beyond its normal life expectancy by this point in the game is the sole reason 4546B has not yet gone completely lifeless. It suddenly makes sense why the safe shallows seem to have the most life and almost everything around them feels more sparse. That's where the peepers are most common. But of course, the Emperor can't save the world, only keep it from dying, and not for much longer either. So they ask you, the only person they've been able to talk to for god knows how long, to help their eggs hatch, so their babies can go on to cure you and begin the long process of curing the entire world of the Kara bacterium. And I have to draw special attention to the fandom wiki entry on the Sea Emperor, specifically the last part. After its eggs are hatched, the captive Sea Emperor Leviathan will play with its children and then direct them to the arch leading just outside the quarantine enforcement platform which they will leave through. The captive will begin dying shortly afterward, as it has used the last of its strength to play with its babies. Yep. Yep. That's my heart. That's my heart breaking. The story of the Sea Emperor really is the perspective of the world itself being told. It's nature's point of view as outside forces meddle with and exploit it. It's the concept of death and birth, how when life ends, it also begins again. It's an exploration of the idea that even against oppressive odds, nature will do everything it can to survive. Yeah, I'm being dramatic, but this is a story I legitimately love, so I'm gonna nerd about it. It's the kind of story that's fed to you bit by bit as you go through it, sometimes even out of order, but toward the end, it comes together and just has this satisfying click, you know? Where events or things you'd noticed earlier suddenly make a lot more sense and the full scope of the story is brought into focus. It's not an easy kind of narrative to pull off well, but this is definitely one of the better examples of it. And mind you, I said well. There's plenty of games that attempt this kind of story, but don't always hit it just right. It takes a special kind of precision and cleverness in how you direct or encourage the player to progress. Just cutting the story up and scattering it around for them to find isn't enough. It's just a shame that so few people will be able to experience this game in the same way I did. Not anymore, anyway. So much of it is already well known, and it's been out for quite a while now. I was damn lucky to have gone into it knowing as little as I did, because it would not have been the same otherwise. The Reaper Leviathan moment would not have happened if I had known it existed, or the fact that things like it existed at all. Subnautica is one of those games that only gets better the less about it you know going in even if that'll make it all the more terrifying, and I absolutely do not blame people for shying away from it for that fact. But I'd still encourage everyone to at least give this one a look, because it deserves all the praise it gets. And no, it's not perfect, because apparently I need to clarify that, and I already know some of the complaints that some people will have about it, so let's address those real quick. Despite how rich in atmosphere and story it is, and how absolutely terrifying it can be, it's a very easy game. I went in knowing almost nothing about it, and I never died on my first time through. Not even once. Didn't drown, didn't get eaten by a reaper, nothing. 
The game is incredibly generous, giving you three methods of transportation. One that can make you almost undetectable to hostile leviathans, and another that lets you throw hands with everything under the sea. Outside of that, the stasis rifle gives you a lot of breathing room, and renders every hostile encounter survivable because it freezes things in place for so long. This is not a hard game, but that's by design. We already went over this, but I'll reiterate, Subnautica is not a game that is trying to kill you. And for people looking for a purely mechanically challenging game, they won't find one here. It can also get a bit grindy with resource collecting, specifically titanium. You always need titanium, and you never have enough. Nearly everything needs it, and while it is plentiful and easy to get, you will run out of it more than once. Also, this game is just a little bit buggy, and by a little bit, I mean aggressively, at times. It really does seem to vary from playthrough to playthrough, but this isn't the most stable game on the market. I'm sure more than a few people have had a death caused by falling through the world or something. I didn't, but I sure did experience a few anomalies in both of my playthroughs. On more than one occasion, the sea life of 4546B decided that the law of acceleration can just go fuck itself and rocket it into the distance after being slingshot out of the game's environments. And then there was this incident where a reef back initial D toured me with intensity and then proceeded to vanish into the world never to be seen again. I felt like I just witnessed the simulation breaking. And while those negatives and probably others do exist, and I understand if they hinder people's enjoyment, they don't come close to doing that for me. The high points of this game are just too damn good for me to not love it to death. It's one of my new favorite games of all time for a lot of reasons, but one of those reasons is very hard to explain in video format. You can't quite get the experience of Subnautica and what makes it great and memorable into a scripted video, or hell, even into a playthrough. I talked about all the things that I think it does great, but there's an intangible effect this game has while playing it that you can really only get when you play it yourself. It's cliche, I know, but that's legitimately how I feel. When my first playthrough was coming to an end, I was both satisfied and also sad. The entire journey had been such an experience, and I was never going to get that again. Sure, I could go back and replay it, but it would never be the same. I guess that's true of any game, but it's especially true of Subnautica. There's a magic and wonder to the whole of it your first time through that I can't put into words. It's a feeling you only get once, and it's a damn good feeling. I'll miss it, but I'm happy to have felt it all the same. Rocketing into the stars on your escape ship, leaving behind a memoir and important items for the next unlucky soul to find themselves trapped there, getting one last look at the world before you speed away into the unknown, it's poignant, and I can't think of a better ending. It's better for an awesome experience to end and leave you wanting more than it is for it to completely outstay its welcome. I feel like I left a piece of myself back on 4546B, and I'm completely okay with that. I think someone's cat found the keyboard. Ha, ha, ha. Excuse me? I'm just a tad bit stupid. Just a tad. Woohoo! Hello again, big guy. You have a habit of just popping into existence. Rather unhealthy, so I'm told. Might wanna, might wanna get that checked out. Oh, oh, this may have been a bad idea. Woohoo! Ooh, curse my bodily need for breathing. What are you doing down here? You okay there, buddy? Ah, excellent. Clearly, this is the true fruits of my labor. For what kind of an explorer could I call myself if I didn't give myself a place to rest my ass? Support your local reef backs, everybody. I think that's everything down here. No matter how fast I am, I cannot outrun a wall that is directly in front of me. Sorry. Hi again. Listen, buddy, I just need to find the other entrance to this place, so if you could kindly fuck off, baby, that would be great and appreciated. Thank you kindly. Jesus Christ, that is the fastest I have ever seen one of these things move. Uh, if I tried to play through this part in VR, I would probably throw up. If we can get 100,000 likes in this video, Seth will attempt to play through Subnautica entirely in VR. I wouldn't get two episodes in. I'd fucking barf so hard.
Hello there, thank you very much for watching the video. This is one of my first attempts at a format like this, so I hope you enjoyed, even if it was a bit rough. If you did, then I'd really appreciate you leaving a like and a comment. It really does help a lot and keeps the algorithm overlords happy. Also, if you're interested, I have a Discord channel that is open to everyone, and I've had it for a while now. A link to it is in the description below. You're welcome to hop over and hang out with us if you want. It's also the best way to keep track of when I post videos and do live streams on Twitch, since I'll always announce them there first and foremost. I also have a Twitter if that's your thing. Thank you very much to my patrons on Patreon and my supporters on Twitch. Y'all are the reason I'm able to do this at all. Oh yeah, and something something subscribe, please. Thank you all for watching, and as always, y'all have a lovely evening, and I'll see you next time.